So yeah, I've known Jeremy for probably, gosh, I've known you since I was 19, I think. So 10 years. So I'm 29. So my first time was in New Orleans. And that was the first time, I was still a fairly new Christian, and that was the first time I really saw some weird stuff. <laughs> right? Yeah. I remember, if we're talking about demons, I remember walking down to the strip one night, and um, where were we going? The French Quarter? Probably French Quarter. Yeah, we were walking down the French Quarter, and we're all in single file line, and as we get closer to the party, you start hearing the music and the crowds and everything. Well, I remember I looked to my left, and there's this tall, skinny woman screaming in this not a normal voice, really high pitch, moving back and forth, and it was just, it was really interesting. But being in those moments, you just, the Holy Spirit really works mm -hmm. through you, and you see some really cool stuff. Hey, God, last place on earth, you know, we, it's probably one of the first places I learned to open air preach, and just to witness to people who um, were there for drugs, obviously, but they are still attentive. I think one of the best memories I have, actually, every time I open up my Bible to a chapter in Psalms, it's water dented. Because one morning, and it was winter, and it was raining, and one morning this guy just wanted me to read him Psalms. And uh, he was there every week, and he always came up to me when I got there. And I was just reading him Psalms, and it started raining. It was freezing out, but, and I didn't care that my Bible was getting wet because I thought it was a, it was a good reason. So every time I look at my Bible in that part, that's cool. So hmm. lots of cool memories street when seeing, but yeah. So um, about a year ago, I started. Well, maybe nine months ago. So back when we were still in Charlotte, I started um, memorizing scripture. Um, just because I'm in the car a lot and can't really read, so I figured I'd memorize it and then recite it to myself. So one of the verses I decided to memorize is one of the verses that's going to be my main scripture for tonight. Um, it's out of Galatians. But one thing that the scripture's calling us to do, it's usually brought in the light of the world. The world brings it into light of something good, usually. And when I mention these words, you're going to be like, yeah, you're going to think of situations or scenarios later. Yeah, that's good. I mean, everybody has these types of things. And so... The scripture is Galatians 5.24, um, but before I get into it, I want to pray real quick. So Lord, we thank you for uh, gathering tonight, we thank you for the, the group that's here. We just uh, appreciate um, your word for us to study, to um, learn, to read, Holy Spirit that you teach us, and we just pray for um, the movement of your spirit within everybody here tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that you um, speak your words to us, and um, and teach us what you want us to know in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ. I'm going to stop there real quick. So, Paul is talking to Christians. People who belong to Christ. Someone who's made Jesus their Lord. Um, born again. A new creation. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to... Um, non-believers. He's not talking to atheists. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to the church, those who belong to Christ. The next part, he says, those who belong to Christ have nail. So picture a nail and a hammer and wood. Okay. Passions and desires. Now, when you hear passions and desires, like I said, brought in a good light, what do you think of? Everybody has passions, right? Everyone's passionate about something. Everybody has desires about something. I'm passionate about my wife. I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about um, woodworking. I'm passionate about rock climbing. I'm passionate about coffee. I desire coffee when I wake up in the morning, right? We have desires. I, I desire um, vacations. I desire certain goals. I des we all have desires, right? It's usually brought in the context of something good. And I think the majority of people would agree that passions and desires are usually good things. Well, this scripture is pointing at passion, passions and desires in a different way. It's flipping the switch to the opposite of what is normally thought of when we think of passions and desires. And so the definition, and I actually thought this was really interesting. I think I've always thought 
I've always had the wrong definition of passion when I think about it. And I'm not sure if the majority of people do, but when, I was really shocked when I read this definition. Desires, I think I, I've always thought of it this way, but passions, the dictionary definition of passions is strong and barely, a strong and barely controllable emotion. So when I think about the passions that I had just said, strong and barely controllable emotion, I think that puts passions in a whole different light. Like, I'm not that passionate about rock climbing. I cannot barely control myself to go rock climbing. I enjoy it, yeah. I love it, but I'm not that passionate about it. I'm that passionate about Laura, <laughs> but rock climbing and some other things, woodworking, I love it, I love doing it, but it's not something where I'm biting my nails to go do. Like, it's not something I can barely control. So that kind of put a whole new light on passions for me. And then desires, the definition of desires is a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. So that as well, that's something like, that's, it's going to happen. A desire you have, that thing is going to eventually happen. So like, I mentioned coffee. I wake up every morning, I have coffee. I don't know if, I don't think that is considered desire because it's gonna happen no matter what. I don't have to wish for it, it's just gonna happen. I wake up, I go downstairs, coffee's in my cabinet, I got water, I'm having it. Other things like desires, like a vacation. You desire vacation, you know you're gonna have it, but it's a little more of a stretch. You gotta wait, you gotta have some patience, it'll come. So to me, when it's talking about desires and passions, this scripture is going to bring it into a different light. And so the next part of the scripture is, so those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature. So it's not talking about good passions or good desires. Now it's talking about the passions and desires that lead to us to sin, the temptations. And it's, it's not a good passion, it's not a good desire. Um, so if you think about those definitions, strong and barely controllable, think about a passion, a temptation that comes to you, you can barely control it. It's going to lead to something bad, um, a desire, something bad within you. You are desiring something bad, and you will eventually come to pass. And so this scripture is a warning to a Christian saying, take your passions and desires that are of your sinful nature. And the next part, and the last part of the verse is uh, nail them to the cross and crucify them there. And crucify is put to death by nailing or binding them to a cross. So you are literally taking that bad passion, that bad desire, that thing that is tempting you that's not of your nature, your Christian nature, and you're taking that you're nailing it, and then you're killing it. So you're leaving it. Mm. The thing I struggle with this, in the old saying, easier said than done, right? You read this, it's easier said than to actually do this. Like, how do you do this? So I'll put it in terms like this. A passion and desire is invisible, right? If you were to show me this Bible, this Bible is physical. I can literally open it and read it, and I'm looking at words. Well, a passion, you can't read my passion, right? I can't read your what's going on in your mind. I can't read your desires. I can't see it. You can't physically see it. So how can you lay something you can't physically see? It's not an element. You can't take it out of your brain, make it into an element, put it on a cross, and let it die there, and then it's gone and walk away. Because it's, it's inside of you, right? How do you... So, this scripture is easier said than done, and the Holy Spirit, so I've been studying this verse probably for about the last nine months, I've been trying to figure out a way, how do you actually apply this, and put those passions and desires, and actually leave them there, so they don't come back to you, because if you crucify something, if it's to death, how is it going to come back to life and come back? If it's dead, how will it actually come back 
to you? How can that passion come back to you? Um, so, in the next scripture, we're staying in the book of Galatians, but um, the Holy Spirit did show me how to do that, but we're going to save that for later. i got to keep you on your, the edges of your seat. So, <laughs> so, the difference between physical and figurative. So, to me, physical is literal. Like, if you tell me to run up that hill, it's a steep hill, whatever, to me, that's easy because it's something I can actually go do. It's something I can actually see through. It's easy to go do it. But this verse is figurative. It's, it's telling us you can do this, but you can't actually physically do it. You're working it out spiritually. You're working it out by yourself, invisibly. Um, so figurative is an expression of language to describe something. And so that's what Paul's doing. He's, he's telling us you have these passions and you have these desires that's not of your Christian nature. It's not going to lead to fruit. It's going to cause you to fall. It's going to cause you to stumble. Um, passions and desires of our sinful nature. It's temptations that are stumbling blocks to us in our progression as Christians. So, our passions are visible to the eye. The only way we can see them is through our imagination. So God gave us our imagination. That's how. That's where the passions and desires, that's where the things lurk within. And that's how we can see. So we need to use the Holy Spirit to help um, show those to us, guide us, um, so we can eventually um, be delivered from that thing. So in Galatians 2.20, My old self has been crucified with Christ. I'm going to stop there real quick. So, my old self, this is B.C., this is before Christ, before you knew Jesus. This is the, the person you used to be. This is um, without knowing the difference between good and evil. Before Christ, how did you know what was good? Truly, how do you know what was good? The world, I think, morally speaking, the world knows what's good. People who don't believe in God knows what's good. You know murder's wrong, stealing's wrong, lying's wrong. There's things that it's just a universal good and a universal bad, right? But when you give your life to Christ, you're, there's a whole lot more that's unveiled. God's um, way of life for us is revealed in a different light. So before Christ... What was good was different than what is good now. What was bad is different than what is bad now. Like, before I knew Christ, I was a good person. I knew the difference between good and bad. You know, and during high school, I did community service. I loved people. I, I was nice to people. I knew not to hurt people. I knew not to kill people. You know, there's, there's a good that you just know. You know, you know. But yet, I was still a sinner. I was still, I didn't know God's law. I didn't know God's goodness. I didn't know what was right and what was wrong in the eyes of God. I believed in God, but I didn't live for God. And so there was, there's a difference to that. And the day I gave my life to Christ, everything changed. No one ever taught me at that moment. I was stubborn. I didn't pay attention to preachers before I gave my life to Christ. When I gave my life to Christ, it was just like that. That's how I know God was real. He convinced me He was real because as soon as I gave my life to Christ, boom, I knew the difference between good and bad instantaneously. And so there, and what, and this is what the Holy Spirit showed me, is Romans 10, 9, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, believe, that's faith. It takes faith to believe. Then you give your life to Christ. You, anyone can say that prayer. Anyone can give their life to Christ. But if you don't believe, if you don't have the faith, you can't go to that next step. I know plenty of Christians who, well, people who have given their life to Christ, but eventually fall off the path of Christianity because they didn't actually have that faith, have that belief. And so that's why it's important when you give your life to Christ, you have that belief. And I had that belief. I had that faith. And so that's the key word, faith. That's how you, 
in Galatians 5.24, that's how you can now lay your passions and desires at the cross, nail it to their crucified there through faith. That's how we do that, because you can't physically take that passion and nail it and then leave it to die, but you can figuratively by faith in Jesus. Preach it. Yeah. Preach it. <laughs> Amen. So, oh. <laughs> so my, my BC days, I didn't know it was good and bad. When I gave my life to Christ, instantaneously, I knew it because of faith. Amen. Yes. We have to have faith. Without faith, how are you going to do anything? Mm -hmm. Tr truly. You know, you talk, Jeremy just talked about faith in, you have to have faith to tell a demon to leave the body. Otherwise, that demon's going to beat you up. Right? <laughs> I mean, how, how, how can you do anything without faith? So, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's how we can lay down our desires, our passions of our sinful nature at His cross. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, trusting faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So, it's faith. It takes faith. You know, those who belong to Christ nail the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucify them there through faith. That's how we can do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to go back to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to talk about, this is right before Galatians 5.4. So we're going to go into Galatians 5.19 through 23, and it's going to talk about the, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, bad, and then we'll get into good. So 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the passions and desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living, this is a key part, and this is for Christians and non-Christians. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the call to us in Galatians 5.24 is really important because it's a, it's a warning. It's saying, take what's bad and leave it at the cross. Because let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we need to die daily to those things that are lurking within. Um, everything that he just named. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So we need to include the Holy Spirit um, to, to look within. You know, we have that relationship with, with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's our guide. He's our helper. He's the one who's going to point those things out to us. You know, you may not think you have any bad passions or desires, things that are, are so strong that you can't control. You know, the, the passion that you can barely control, the desire that is going to eventually bring something to pass that's not good. You may not know of one that might be there, but that's why we have the Holy Spirit as our helper to help us, to help us show us these things 
that are lurking within us that we can nail to his cross. So let us not be come conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Hallelujah. I think the biggest thing from that set of scriptures is we will not inherit the kingdom of God for those that live of those fruits. And so, taking heed of the, the advice given to us in 524 has been a big thing for me when God started having me memorize these scriptures this one really stood out to me the most because who wouldn't want these these fruits the, the good ones the the love the joy the peace the patience the kindness the goodness the faithfulness the gentleness and the self-control all those things we can have those spirits but we have to invite the Holy Spirit into our life. We have to, to live by every day picking up our cross. Every, and someone recently mentioned this to me, and I, I was going to do it, but I haven't done it yet. But I think a few weeks ago, they had mentioned that verse. And we are talking about it. I was like, that's great. We literally do need to pick up our cross every day. I should put that in the mirror and read it every day to remind myself, like, and I'm not physically picking up a cross like tonight, we're going to take a cross out, a physical cross. That's great, but that's not the cross that he's talking about. The cross he's talking about is the faith. You're picking up your faith in Jesus Christ every day. You're living out a life of being different. A life before Christ was a lot easier because after Christ, you know temptation. You know sin before Christ. I never fought temptation to do to do worldly things because I didn't know it was bad. And now we fight with that stuff and we have to nail them to the cross and crucify them. And that's the most important part because when you're crucifying it, you are putting that thing to death. And so that may have been a pretty quick sermon, but I think there was a lot of meat good. in there. So praise Absolutely. God. <laughs> I'm going to pray, pray us out real quick. So thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to speak your word tonight. And I just um, pray that you teach us, Holy Spirit. Reveal to us the things that we need to, to nail to your cross, the things that we need to crucify there and leave there. And Lord, I just pray that over every single person here, Lord, that your blessings upon them Lord, and the strengthening of our faith, Lord, and for whoever gets talked to tonight, Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you are out with us and guiding um, everyone's words. And, and uh, you're just providing the wisdom, Holy Spirit, that we are being led by you and with you and for you. And through, and through us, Lord, that um, your word can be done. And we just thank you. I just thank you for this, uh, this church. And Lord, I just pray for the growth of this church, Lord, um, because your word is here. And we just pray for... Uh, people to feel the, the, the urge, Holy Spirit, to come and to, 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 to join and to be a part of this. Um, for those who need to get saved, Lord, we pray for harvesters to go out and to bring them in, Lord. I, I just pray for favor here within TPO and over Pastor Jeremy and Tabitha, Lord, over their leadership. We just pray for, for, we just lift them up to you right now, Lord, and thank you for their faithfulness and everyone involved here. We just thank you in the name of Jesus. We just pray for your divine favor over TPO, yes, Lord, yes. over everything coming forward and in and, and the future that plans fall into place. Um, the devil's plans don't fall into place because I bet you the devil is trying to trip you up, Jeremy, and he's trying to trip everyone up in this church because this church is actually doing something great. And I just pray against that. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that your plans will go forth Amen. in this church. Yes. Hallelujah. That the members of this church will not be attacked. That we will surpass. Um, and we will win victory. Lord, in your name, Jesus, I just pray for your favor here yes, to be here and to continue to grow this congregation. We just thank you, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise you, God.